this time, if you would, please turn in the back of your hymnals to the Heidelberg Catechism. We'll be reading five uh, Heidelberg Catechism questions, and then you as a congregation can respond to the questions uh, with the printed answer. Uh, first, we'll be looking at question number 60. That is found on uh, uh, page 30 in the back of the hymnal. Page 30 in the back, Heidelberg Catechism. Heidelberg Catechism. Question 60 <clears throat> and 61. 60. How are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned or been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. And then number 61, why do you say that by faith alone you're right with God? It's not because of any value my faith has that God is pleased with me. Only Christ's perfection, righteousness, and holiness make me right with God. All I can receive this righteousness and make it mine in no other way than by faith alone. Now turn, if you would, now to questions 88 88, 89, and 90. Kind of supplemental to this train of thought. <clears throat> Particularly focusing on the transition from the old uh, to the new. Question 88 is, what is involved in genuine repentance or conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the coming to life of the new. Question 89 is, what is the dying away of the old self? It is to be genuinely sorry for sin, to hate it more and more, and to run away from it. And number 90, what is the coming to life of the new self? It is wholehearted joy in God through Christ, and a delight to do every kind of good as God wants us to. <clears throat> I hope it will be evident that the link between the Heidelberg Catechism and the Scripture uh, uh, will be uh, evident to your eyes. The passage this morning is Joel chapter 2. Please turn to Joel of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. I'll be reading verses 12 through 27. <clears throat> Now, if you were here last week, you would probably say to yourself, didn't we read that passage last week? And the answer is, you've got a good memory. We did read that passage last week. And uh, I was ordained in 1985, originally. And uh, I'm doing something I never did before. I was so enthralled with the text, I just had another sermon left in me. So, and the cow's not done giving milk yet, so I thought I'd go ahead and fill up another pail. Kind of unusual, I know, it's unusual for me, so. But it's just one of those, this happened. It's either, either the preacher's inspired or he's insipid, so it's one of the two. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 to 27. <clears throat> Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, 
Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride or chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. Make your heritage and, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you approach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise. For he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in their midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how we do pray that your Holy Spirit would accompany the preaching of thy word. We thank you you've given us this revelation, this anticipation of new creation in Christ. We pray now, Lord, may it be of great benefit to our souls as we reflect upon it and as we feed upon it, upon the grain and the wine and the oil. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sin bamboozles us. Bamboozle is actually in the dictionary, believe it or not. It has to do with deceiving and tricking, undermining, bamboozling. We are easily bamboozled by sin. And then afterwards we look back and we say, what was I thinking? And we have regret over it and we cry over it. The sin that bamboozles us also blinds us and binds us and then beats us up afterwards because sin has consequences in our lives that we can't seem to escape. The consequences of shame, the consequences of feeling hollow and empty and of the dry despair that follows it. Joel, in this book, explains that this great locust plague and this drought that came upon uh, Israel in the Promised Land came because of their sin. They themselves were spiritually dry and lifeless, and now they would suffer the consequences of their own land being a dry and lifeless locust-infested land. And Joel calls him on the carpet. He says, you need to face this. You need to repent. Uh, uh, and not just play acting stuff either, of tearing the garment, but not really being heartfelt about it. Uh, not just a simple, well, you know, hey, God, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm my fault. But a true, heartfelt, genuine repentance Joel calls for and emphasizes And of course, when you hear that kind of a call, 
when you hear that kind of let's own up and face up and it, it's difficult uh, often we want to say well I, I'm already in too deep you know I'm, I'm already stuck uh, too much the the muck and the mire is, is all over me and the vacuum bowl is more than what I can handle. Uh, any repair, any restoration, this situation is hopeless. But Joel, though he agrees that the situation is a hopeless one, though he agrees it's serious and though Everyone is already moaning about it. He even brings in the beast of the field uh, moaning about their suffering under the consequences of sin. Uh, he nonetheless wants them to understand a couple things that they're not getting yet. <laughs> Two things, actually. Number one, as as bad as you feel about it, you're actually a lot worse off than what you think. <laughs> and number two, God's grace is far greater than what you've ever imagined. God's salvation to turn things around is exceeding anything that you've ever thought of. In other words, Joel is trying to say to them here, God's response to your repentance is beyond your wildest dreams. 12 through 17, we looked at that text where the people are called to assemble. They're called to repentance for their covenant unfaithfulness. They're called to this deep tearing of the heart, not just the garment, and urgent repentance. Doesn't matter if you just said your marriage vows and haven't gotten to step two yet, you come and repent. Joel says. Deep and urgent is the call. Then in 18 through 27, we have God's response. An overwhelming response. Verse 13 says God is abounding in loving kindness. And we've already looked at that word, loving kindness. God's has said his covenant love and loyalty. His covenant love and loyalty that will, will not let go. A spiritual bulldog from God's heart under the tails of his people. It's a response of God, not of mere renewal of the old covenant. Joel, you and we must understand, Joel, as he speaks of the recovery and restoration of God, exceeds the boundaries of the old covenant setting. He's going beyond it. Joel's looking into the new covenant in Jesus Christ where God's restoration is a proverbial new creation, not just the restoration of the earth and the promised land over there in the Mideast. The consequences of their sin as expressed in this devastating locust plague in chapter 1. Uh, God called it that, his great army, Verse 20, his great army that he had sent is going to be replaced. It's going to be replaced in such a way that your response will be rejoicing and gladness. Yes, that locust army devastated your crops. They did great things. <laughs> they hurt you and suffering the consequences. But the Lord also has great things far exceeding that. What a blessing. What a blessing after being bamboozled and beat up by sin to discover the magnitude of the grace of God in Jesus Christ that is on Joel's prophetic vision here. You don't have to stay stuck. God will pull you out. God will place you, as Joel says, in a pasture land of the fullness of spiritual food of a fullness of grain and wine and oil. As he says in verses 19 through 22, the Lord answered and said to his people, verse 19 is the answer now, they've assembled, the priests have confessed, 
They expressed their repentance, and in verse 19, he said, The Lord answered his people now. Behold, I'm sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. There's this answer. Remember, we saw how the locusts totally mowed down all the grain, all the grape vines, all the trees, their olives. It mowed it all down. Now it says, now God is going to send you grain and wine and oil. The grain and the wine and oil, first of all, was used in the sacrificial system of the temple. That had come to a grinding halt. That's going to be restored. Worship will be restored. But also the very same grain and wine and oil was not only for the sacrificial system and the worship of God, it was used for sustenance in life itself. I mean, that's what you ate and drank. The grain with bread and wine and oil. So you see what Joel is saying. He's bringing them together. He's bringing the worship of the people and God and the people together, eating together the grain and the wine and the oil. It's a communion of covenant life is on the horizon in response to their repentance. It was all gone. They had run out. But now it's on its way back. It was coming in again. The sacrificial elements, the wine, or the grain and the wine and the oil, those are pictures. Those are old covenant pictures. Of the sacrifices that point to Christ in the new covenant. That's what Joel's looking at. See, Christ is the bread of life. He is that grain that Joel looks forward to. For he himself said, I am the bread of life. You must eat of Christ if you are to have life eternal. The wine also anticipates Christ. The wine anticipates Christ in his death. If the bread and the grain anticipate Christ in his incarnation, that God became man in Jesus Christ, the wine tells us that the culmination to this life of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, would be death. The wine and the oil. Or well, the oil is spoken of In Psalm 45, verse 7. Psalm 45, 7 is quoted in Hebrews 1, having to do with Christ. So thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, it says. Therefore thy God has anointed you with the joy of gladness. See, Christ would sit at the right hand of the Father in his throne and be in that realm of the consummation and on the throne of God in heaven. It is a realm in the heavenly places. It is a place of joy. There is no more tears in heaven. So Joel, as he looks forward to the grain and the wine and the oil, is looking forward to Christ. The grain and the bread of his earthly life the wine, the end of his earthly life and shedding his blood on the cross and the oil, an indication of his heavenly life. A picture of Christ's own humanity. A humanity that will satisfy, that will ratify, and will realize the new covenant. Totally beyond the boundaries of Joel's own world. But as a prophet, he could look into the future. So no matter how ravaged and ripped up our lives might be here due to our sin and through our conscience accusing us of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and having never kept any of them, even though that reality may strike you, and even though the reality may strike you that you are in a bad place against all this, against all the locust plagues of life, that mow us down is this wonderful prophetic promise that God will bring the grain and the wine and the oil in Jesus Christ. And how important, how critical it is that we especially lay hold of the middle one, the wine, the cross of Christ, the wine of his blood. 
For it's in the cross that God has mightily dealt with our sin. A pervasive, eternal blow and judgment has been issued on our sin in the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 20 he says, I will remove the northerner far from you, drive him into a parched, desolate land, his vanguard in the eastern sea, his rear guard in the western sea. Uh, the stench and the foul smell of him will arise. Joel is referencing that locust plague, that locust plague that came in and covered the land. God says, that curse of the locust plague, I'll remove it. Even though he's done great things. Even though sin and its consequences have ravaged the lives of his people. But because of Christ, God has done something even greater. And how important it is, isn't it, for number one, to face the music that's actually playing with regard to our sin and our consequences. And number two, to be able to face the wonder and the magnitude of the grace of God that exceeds it in Jesus Christ. Joel prophesies the removal of the curse. And that can only be in Jesus Christ. Because of Christ, we can truly say that a new creation has come and the old fallen world has passed away. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5.17 that I had read earlier. A new creation. The old passed away. The old and all of its fallenness, all of its laboring under the curse has gone. A new creation has emerged in Jesus Christ. A new covenant in Jesus Christ, ratified by his own blood, and therefore a new life. A new life in response to our repentance. Now, Joel makes it clear that this is fruitfully applied, this sharing with Christ, this union with Christ, this partaking of Christ, this communion with Christ is applied to the lives and the hearts of his people by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that comes down from heaven, from Christ. Comes down from heaven. The Holy Spirit is referenced by Joel as the early and the latter rains. The Spirit that brings us into union with Him who is the bread and the wine and the oil. Look at verse 23 and 24 as Joel goes on to open up the richness. Be glad, O children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He's given the early rain for your vindication. He's poured down for you rain the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. See, the rains refer to the Spirit, just like the rain comes down from heaven. The Spirit comes down from heaven. Remember, we saw how when uh, G uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and we learned that John the Baptist was just a, a, an old covenant symbol of baptism with water. But, but Joe def, uh, John deferred to Jesus. And he said that Jesus is the real baptizer. I just baptize with water. I'll just get you wet. But Jesus is the real baptizer. He baptized with the waters of the Spirit, John says. And of course those waters of the Spirit, that great baptism of the Spirit that John's baptism anticipated occurred on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit was poured out from Christ, from Christ who is the inhabitor of the spiritual and the heavenly realm and the baptizer of it with his people. And Joel tells us here that he has given the early rain for your righteousness. The early rain. The early rain is when Christ was baptized. And the Spirit came down out of heaven. The heavenly dove came down upon Christ. And he heard those wonderful words. 
This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. See, the early reign is for our, our righteousness. It's found in Christ. Don't think you could ever submit your life to God and God's going to inspect it with the perfect righteousness of his inspection and say, oh, my son in whom I'm well pleased. There's only one person that ever heard that exam ending with my son in whom I'm well pleased. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. Him and him alone. And the spirit was given to Christ as the early reign because of his righteousness that he told John he must fulfill. But there is also the latter reign. The latter reign is the reign that comes on the day of Pentecost. A reign that comes because our righteousness that secures the heavenly realm of the Spirit is in Jesus Christ. And so from heaven, he pours out that Holy Spirit because Christ's righteousness has obtained that Spirit for his people. Our righteousness has not obtained it. We can't come to God and say, Lord, give me life for my righteousness has obtained it. My righteousness deserves it. That's what the law says, isn't it? Remember the ABCs of the law? Life conditioned upon fulfilling the righteous demands of the law. Eternal life conditioned upon fulfilling the righteous demands of the law. Christ and Christ alone has fulfilled the righteous demands of the law. And thus he heard the voice of the Father. And thus he received the endowment of the Spirit of God. And so we too must find our righteousness in Christ to receive those waters of life from above. We must not think we can dig our way out of our own pit, kind of escape our own little dramatic uh, locus infestation because we're going to try harder and we're going to really mean it this time. All of our vigorous efforts of righteousness fall short. Only boomerangs back for us to face the inspection of God's judgment. We must look to Christ. We must look to Christ by faith alone. He possesses perfect, rich righteousness. As Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are what? The poor in spirit. The the, the poor mean uh, they have nothing to bring. They have no money. They're poor. They're in debt. Blessed are those who are self-consciously in debt, spiritually before God. Poverty stricken before God. Why? Because they are candidates. They're now positioned to hold out those empty, debt-ridden hands and receive the rich righteousness of Jesus Christ and receive eternal life in the gift of His Holy Spirit. He pours out the latter rain for the poor in spirit. He pours out the latter rain for those who who mourn. He pours out the latter rain for those who thirst and hunger for righteousness. So brothers and sisters, tear off that hair shirt of depression that you think is going to gain ground before God. Get off that little rodent wheel of righteousness that you're spinning over and over. Lay it aside. Repent. Turn to Christ. Christ, the locust slayer. Christ, the true rain maker from heaven for our dry and dusty lives. And what does the Spirit do when the Spirit comes down from heaven to his thirsty and dry people? What does the Spirit do? And it brings you into union with Christ. That's what he does. Verse 24, Joel anticipates it. Verse 24, The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vat shall overflow with wine and oil. See what the rains bring us? The rains bring us 
Christ overflowing in his redemptive work, the bread, the grain, the wine, the oil. Spirit doesn't just come and make us all silly in the spirit. Spirit comes and points us to Christ. Point us to our emotional state. How jazzed I am. How upbeat and back slapping I am in the spirit. No, the spirit brings us to Christ. To eat and to drink of Christ. Christ in his human life, full of grain. Christ in his cross, vats overflowing with wine. What a picture of adequacy, of forgiveness. Overflowing vats of wine. Christ in his heavenly life of gladness overflowing with oil. Does this not beckon us to come out of our miserable locust drama and come to Christ in his fullness to dip in our ladle and drink? You, me, our horizontal linear lines on this fallen planet and our fallen hearts, it all breeds death until we find life, true life in Christ. He is the bread. He is the wine. He is the oil. I know you might come back with me and say, you don't know the mess I've made of things. You don't know my mess. My mess is going to hang around and just continue to haunt me. It's interesting preaching. But I'm going to be, continue to be haunted with my mess. It doesn't need to be that way. The reason it doesn't need to be that way is because of verse 20, when God said he's removed that nasty, hovering, dark locust plague. And number two, he's replaced it. Verse 25, he tells us he's replaced the locust plague. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. That word for restore is an awesome word, by the way, very popular Old Testament word. That word is the word shalom. I will shalom to you the years the locusts have eaten. You may have been devastated quite well. You might have a pretty bad history. God says, I will restore to you, I will shalom to you those years. Old Palmer Robertson, an Old Testament scholar, and I rarely read any books, but he says it so well with regard to this passage, I can't help but bring it up. I shall restore the years the locust has eaten. What a glorious phrase. No richer promise can be found in the Bible. It's like the words of the psalmist, weeping endures for night, but joy comes in the morning. Or like the book of Revelation where he says he'll wipe away all tears from their eyes and they will remember them no more. Do you mourn over the lost years of your life? Do you think back with bitterness of soul as you remember the wasted years of youth when you didn't serve the Lord? Was it 20 years, 30, more? before you humbled yourself in repentance. The Lord restores the years the locust has eaten, all of them. Have you spent a number of years living in carnality, lukewarmness, doing only what pleases you? Have you made a number of serious mistakes in your life? Do you make some hasty decisions that you now regret? Do you often muse over those decisions that affect and the effect they've had on your life? Did you leave school too early? Did you make a hasty choice in marriage? Did you fail to recognize the perfect partner for you? Have you gone through a divorce? Have you gone through an abortion? Did you conceive a child out of wedlock? Did you make a bad business decision that cost you? Did you lose a lot of money in the market? Did you miss out on an investment opportunity? Did you move your family when you should have stayed put? Did you not move when you should have went and it was right? Did you buy a house when the market wasn't right? Or you sold it and lost your shirt? 
Did you rebel against wise counsel of your parents and not listen because you were smarter than them? Do you live in mortal terror that somehow people would discover the great mistakes of your past? <clears throat> Living with regrets is itself a sin for a Christian. Regret is the sorrow of the world that works death. Living with regret has nothing to do with godly repentance that leads to life and restoration. Living with regret means you refuse to believe the glorious truth that God restores the years the locust has eaten. You continue to mull over your past failures. Don't insult the glorious redemption Christ has accomplished. Believe him. Start rejoicing. Look your failure straight in the eye and listen to Satan's accusations no more. Trust in God's ability to restore the years the locust has eaten. Listen to God's word of redemption in Jesus Christ. Not only does God remove the old, he replaces it with the new, the new creation, his shalom, as it is called. A passing age of locust replaced with a new world of the winged dove instead. God's shalom through the cross and resurrection of Christ. The cross, the end of the old, the resurrection, the emergence of the new. This is totally unlike the Old, old Covenant storyline, brothers and sisters. The Old Covenant storyline, they'd repent, what would happen? They'd go right back to it. They'd repent and have to repent over again. The Old Covenant storyline, they could never gain traction because they could never find release, forgiveness, and transformation. Joel sees this on the prophetic horizon in the New Covenant. Remember, this is what God has done in Christ. This is his great thing that trumps the great thing of sin and its consequences. So Joel ends in verses 26 and 27. You shall, be, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You shall praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. There is none else. My people shall never be put to shame. Two times in two verses he said, my people will never be put to shame. That, we, that word having to be, do with a putting to shame has to, be, has to do with being brought under, brought back under God's judgment. And then being shamed because of it as the nations of the world look upon the people of God and go, oh boy, you're back under God's curse like us again. God says that will never again happen in the new covenant. We'll not fall back under God's curse, God's wrath to be seen by all. Rather look at what Joel says in contrast to that is, you know, not only not fall back under shame, but look what he says. First of all, you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. There will be plenty of redemptive nourishment for you in Jesus Christ, in the grain and the wine and the oil. <coughs> Christ will be your nourishment and satisfy your heart. Secondly, he says there will be plenty of praise. You'll praise the name of the Lord your God. You have praise. Praise to him for the great things he has done. Plenty of praise. And lastly, he says there will be plenteous, plenteous covenant dwelling of God with his people. Remember in the old covenant, how the old covenant, God leaves the people of God. He leaves the temple of the Lord. He departs from them. Joel is looking at a day when that will not happen. Joel is looking at a day when You'll be able to say that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, covenantly bound to you permanently through Jesus Christ forever and ever. No shame. So we see that Joel faced God's curse. Joel faces the locust plague. He faces the drought. And Joel looks for another day. He looks for another day in which there will be a new covenant. He even looks to the day 
of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. A day of the new creation. A day of rich rains. A day of plenteous food and wine and oil in Christ. That's the day that Joel sees upon the prophetic horizon that we now in Christ have for us to share it. So let us repent. Let us not be bamboozled by our lying lusts anymore. But let us repent. And move into this arena where we have new life on tap for the people of God. The life of the wine, the bread, the oil. The life of Christ himself for us to partake of. The life that is hidden with God in Christ, as Paul says. A life that is drawn down from heaven as we reach out an empty hand and take it by faith. Let us pray.